All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chet Donnelly. I'm a spine surgeon here in my very hometown of Dallas, Texas. And sometimes on the afternoons for maybe 20, 30 minutes at a time, I'll jump on and I'll go over different spine surgery topics. Talk about the cervical spine, some of the thoracic spine, and some of the lumbar spine. So in general, in terms of what I hope to accomplish today, I'm in my hometown here in Dallas, Texas. This isn't supposed to really be a marketing or anything from that standpoint. It's really purely education. I'll try to dumb it down, for lack of better words, just use really simple terms. But I think the number one thing I really try to tell patients when I see them in the office is someone just go over a spine model with them. So I'm gonna, I always like to start that just kind of gives you an idea of some of the stuff we're talking about and then give you a couple definitions. I think kind of having a little foundation is really helpful. So you have the neck, which is the cervical spine, the back, lower back, lumbar spine, and they're kind of different. It's kind of like a hip and a knee where they're kind of similar, kind of different. In general, this is a model of a spine. This can be the neck or the lumbar spine. It goes bone, disc, bone, disc, kind of all the way down the spine. And then the back part is where these nerves come out. You have the spinal cord, and then it actually stops in the rib cage and becomes a fecal sac, a bunch of little nerve roots running down. So the reason people get pinched nerves or back pain or shooting down pain is a couple different things. But in general, if you have numbness and tingling going down and it's from the spine, it's from a nerve being pinched. How does the nerve get pinched? Either a disc herniation, squeezing back, hitting that nerve, arthritis, so these joints rubbing. And arthritis is like a huge medical term in a way where a bunch of different things can be arthritis. When I say arthritis, I'm talking about like if you get a callus formation on your hand from overuse, you can similarly get a callus formation on these joints, just kind of rubbing, you get some wear and tear. They're normally almost like your fingernails rubbing, nice smooth surface or ice. Ice on ice is a very smooth surface. But just like if you get some arthritis in your kneecap or your hip joint or your elbow, they start rubbing. Those rubbing starts growing tissue, extra bone, extra tissue in this all over the joints. That's okay. That's honestly not that big of a deal, I say. But when it starts growing down into the nerves, that's the number one thing that causes patients pain the number one thing that causes stenosis. So stenosis is just a big fancy medical word for um, squeeze nerves, squeeze neural elements. You can get in the middle, that's central stenosis, or spinal stenosis. You can get these nerve tunnels, that's foraminal stenosis. You can get it from these bones slipping forward, that's spondylolisthesis causing stenosis. So again, a bunch of huge words, but to simplify it, Things that squeeze nerves cause stenosis, disc herniations, arthritis, tumors, infections, fractures, traumas. You know, those are much less common. And if you're watching here today, you probably don't have a, you know, well, maybe do a big tumor, a raging infection causing the stenosis. But in general, that's what stenosis is. It's pinched nerves. See people sending gifts. Appreciate it. Don't send any gifts. Um, just doing this from education. Save those for, you know tribes in Africa that are on social media trying to make a living. So don't send me any gifts. I do appreciate it, but don't send anything, please. All right. So with that being said, let's kind of go over some fixes for spinal stenosis and back pains. And to do that, let me kind of get to some questions. And again, I can't really give like specific advice, but I can kind of give you like some general guidance of uh, some things to think about. Um, just as a background, because I see that some of the same questions coming in. I am in Dallas, Texas, uh, spine surgeon, six person spine surgery group. I appreciate the likes and shares. The only reason I care is that helps promote this to your peers that might be having similar issues going on. And it's kind of nice. Um, you know, if you're going through something, this kind of helps get it to someone else. So it's all good. Luke, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the comments, but, um, again, save your gifts. Okay. So let me get to some questions now. So grade five spondylosis thesis. Oh my God. That's a real one to start with. Is fusion the only option? Uh, yes. I doubt you have grade five. And you're like, well, how do you know? Well, grade five is kind of rare. Grade five, it essentially is, it goes, most people are grade one and two. It's where you have arthritis in the back and it slips just a little. It goes from quarter, then 25%, 50%, 50%, 75%. Grade five is called spondyloptosis. I don't want to do it to this model because I don't want to break my model. But essentially, this bone is completely slid off. Maybe you have five. That'd be pretty rare. Usually, it's not from a slow degenerative process. Usually if you have grade five, it's a congenital process. You're almost born like that and it started off like that. And so as you see grade five in the late teens and early twenties. So um, if you really have a grade five, 
congrats for making it this long with that diagnosis not being fixed. But yes, fusion is an, a, the only option. If you're avoiding it because you don't want to fusion, your spine is dislocating. It is probably already fused at other levels because of that issue. So a different argument there. That's a confusing, aggressive one to start with. So from Julie, have you dealt with many cauda equina syndrome patients? Yeah, but usually it's not a chronic cauda equina syndrome. It's acute. And not do you, I try, I try to use too many medical words here, but there's just something that's acute and chronic. It's kind of like something that happened right then, like you fell down a ladder or you got shot in the back or something like that. That's an acute change, right? Chronic is like a slow wear and tear. Acute cauda syndrome is a surgical urgency, a surgical emergency. Chronic, I'm not saying you downplay, but it's almost like that's been going on for months and decades, maybe the damage is already done. So you're still wanting to fix it and get right to it. But maybe it's not a surgical emergency, like middle of the night type of surgery. Um, and I'd also kind of challenge you a little like, well, do you really have cauda equina? Because technically to have cauda equina syndrome, you don't have any sensation in the legs, you don't have any bowel and bladder function. So if you're just at home watching this now, kind of chilling, I would question if you had that exact diagnosis, but maybe you have something else, but maybe not cauda equina syndrome necessarily. Are there any case reports that show spinal cord regeneration from Navy wife? Um, there's probably more than case reports. There's probably level two, even level three evidence. Uh, case reports are level five. Again, I'm trying not to get too technical here. But yes, there's definitely options to regrow nerves, regrow stem cells and stuff like that from spinal cord injury. Uh, from Julie, I had uh, emergency cauda equinus syndrome. Oh, there you go. So and left with complications. Well, Again, I don't know anything about your case, but left with complications. If you had an emergency paralysis impending and they weren't able to reverse it completely, I don't know if I'd 100% call it a complication. It might be something where, you know, they try to stop the complete paralysis and maybe they did, maybe they only had to stop some of it. Sometimes it's hard to prevent an entire spinal cord injury once it stops, starts from a traumatic onset. Have you seen someone? I got a lot of questions about spinal cord injury today. All right. Here's another one. I had an ACDF surgery with the fusion. Can I still see a chiropractor? I'd ask your doctor, your surgeon, but usually, yeah, I'm totally okay with um, people seeing chiropractic doctors after pretty much any spine surgery you get, not immediately. And it, different spine surgeries have different things. It could be just a laminectomy, it could be a disc replacement, it could be a huge fusion, it could be a small fusion. But in general, I'm okay with chiropractors. It's something where uh, I'd like to kind of help guide some of the treatment, but I do think there's a good role for, for non-operative management and spine surgery, and that would include chiropractors. Uh, appreciate the likes, appreciate the shares coming through. Um, appreciate all the comments. So from Teresa, can you recommend someone in Columbus? I apologize, I don't know anyone in Columbus. If there's any spine surgeon from Columbus watching here, go ahead and give a shout. Um, from Pilly, one of my longtime friends, he's been he or she, actually, I don't know if Pilly's a guy or girl, has been commenting forever. I'm still collecting info before I press the button for my surgery. Do you recommend a brace after spondylolisthesis surgery? I do. Your doctor or surgeon might not. But I put a brace, an LSO brace, on almost all surgeries for six weeks after. Some people do it shorter. Some people do it longer. But I'd kind of say in general, six weeks after a fusion is pretty typical. Other people might have... Um, different timelines. I don't think there's a ton of peer-reviewed evidence that shows the specific length or type of brace having a huge impact. I think you just need huge numbers. I mean, you know, the complications are so small to where you have to do huge numbers to really tease out. So it's one of those things where just because the complication rate is so slow from a brace versus no brace, it's probably going to be hard to see. Um, from Be Kind, um, I don't have an answer for you there. Um, and then Julie, kind of going back to your emergency cauda equina surgery. So you're saying you got batter, blow, and foot drop after. Uh, it's a bummer. I wonder how the cauda equina started in the first place. So it's pretty tough. Uh, I just had two disc replacements on Wednesday. Do I need anti-inflammatories now from Olivia? Olivia, I'd ask your doctor. Uh, totally up to them. It, it's a little bit of a debate. But usually after a disc replacement, for the surgeries I do, and your doctor might be totally different, so it's not advice in your case, but after disc replacements, I do prescribe anti-inflammatories for most patients for about two weeks to six weeks with the thought of anti-inflammatories decrease, decrease the rate of bone fusion and bone healing. And after a disc replacement, we don't want the bones to fuse or heal in the front part of the spine. Um, there's not, again, a ton of data to show that that's actually helpful. So 
So it's just a conversation with the patient. If you're just taking an Advil or to leave twice a day for a couple weeks, probably doesn't hurt. Um, so it's just anecdotal evidence. Another question coming in from Gal is kyphoplasty over tibroplasty safe for compression fractures? Uh, yep. Yes, they are. Those are good procedures. Um, one of them you put a you put, you put a cannula, cannula in, you put then a balloon, kind of re-expand it and backfill with cement. That is definitely a good form for acute or sub-acute compression fractures. And when I say acute or sub-acute, I'm talking about the timeline. Usually that's kind of in the first six weeks, maybe in the first three months. Usually you can get an MRI, and if there's increased signal in the bone, that's edema, that's swelling, and that shows that there's still a potential. One, that could be a pain generator. That's most important. You don't want to do surgery if that's not going to get it better. But two, if there's micro motion there, um, then kyphoplasty definitely could be warranted for sure. From Henry, Dr. Donnelly, I am certain that I have one level, that I have a one level spine fusion at four or five degenerative disc with grade two spondylolisthesis coming up. I am certain. Okay. Well, sorry, I'm trying to say there's more to that question. I just worry about adjacent levels after. So I'm certain that I have a one level spine fusion coming up. Okay. Okay. That's kind of a confusing way to say it, Henry, but I hear you now. So it sounds like from your question, as you said, you have a, you have a one level fusion at four or five because you have a grade two spondylolisthesis. And you're worried about the adjacent levels wearing out. Well, a couple things. First of all, if you have grade two, that's a pretty decent slip. And there's not a good way without fusion to fix a grade two. You could, I don't recommend this on grade twos usually, unless you're like super old or super sick, just do a laminectomy. That's where you just shave the bone back. But on a grade two, particularly if it's an unstable grade two, that's likely just going to be a temporary fix. So, yes, you do need to fusion for that. Are the other levels going to wear out? Well, there's a lot to say that. So Henry's asking a question here all the time. If you get one level fused, is the other level going to wear out? Here's a great way to think about that. It's like saying if you got a knee scope on one knee and then a knee scope on the other knee, and you had to get a knee scope again, and then finally you have to get a knee replacement. Well, it's not like you got the knee replacement because of the knee scopes. It's just you had normal wear and tear, normal arthritis, and eventually it just needed a bigger fix. Okay, but that's all in the same joints. Now say in that same argument, the knee scope, you get the knee replacement, but now like the hip wears out or your ankle wears out or your other knee wears out. It's not necessarily because you got a knee replacement there. It's you have the same genetics in every bone and every joint. You have the same trauma, the same sports growing up, the same wrestling with your kids, the same jumping off the ladders, the same dumb things you've done that hits both joints. Some of it's genetics, some of it's diet, some of it's the same weight hitting all the joints. Some of it's just the lifestyle going through the other joints. It's not necessarily because you had a knee replacement on your left knee that now we have wearing out of your other knee. So it's not 100% apples to apples in the spine because they are a little closer. But that is definitely something I kind of let patients think about. If you get a fusion at L5-S1, well, why'd you have to get that fusion in the first place? Your 4-5 has that same genetics, that L4-5, the level above has the same wear and tear that that 5-1 was experiencing, just at a lesser rate maybe, and 5-1 is taking more of the brunt of it. So in many cases, I show the patient, look, your L5-S1 has the issue. Your 4-5 doesn't look perfect. It looks a little wear and tear. Let's just fix 5-1, just fix the issue at hand today, just fix the symptomatic thing today. And if 4-5 needs something in the future, I jokingly say I'm not retiring anytime soon. We can always fix that in the future. Maybe there's something new out there in 5, 10, 15 years. So I know it doesn't 100% answer your question, Henry, but I'd also think of it this way. You have grade 2 spondylolisthesis. Sounds like you're booked for surgery, and I don't know anything about you, but I'd say think of it. Fortunately, you live in 2025. I don't know where in the world you live in, but fortunately, it sounds like you have surgery booked. You have a spine surgeon that hopefully you like. And that's way more than a lot of people have that have similar issues for you. So, yes, spine fusions are scary, surgery scary. But luckily for you, and I know this is a very glass half full, you have spine surgeons that have taken care of you. They want to get you better. Thankfully, you have the ability to get a fusion. Thank you. Thankfully, you live in, you know, 50 years ago, we weren't doing the fusions the same way we're doing now, even 25 years ago, really. So the only reason I'm saying all that is, yes, they sound scary, but we really do pretty darn good these days. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. There's a lot of different ways to do a fusion. Going through the side, going through the front, all from the back, augmented reality, percutaneous, CT navigation. Those are all things we weren't doing. Some of those things we weren't doing 
even 15 years ago, you know, pretty much every screw I put in now, I use augmented reality. And you're like, I don't really know what that is. It's almost like that heads up display if you're driving a car, a fancy car that has like that speed and everything in front of you, your map in front of you. That's what I do is when I'm putting those screws in, when I'm putting in these pedicle screws in the back, so the patient's asleep, we already on the cages, the patient's still asleep, they're laying down on their belly. I put in this little pin that kind of comes out of the hip just like that. It's about as big as this pin right here. It has a little radar tower on it. I'm doing a really terrible job showing this. Almost like that. It has a little radar tower coming in it. I do a spin with a CT machine, and then I put on this helmet. It's a little clunky, but I'm only wearing it for 30 minutes or so. I put on this helmet, and it projects all the patient's bones under their skin. So essentially, for real, through their skin, I have this helmet. I'm looking through, and I can see every bone, every joint, every arthritis. And you're like, okay, cool, but why does that matter? Well, we didn't have that technology. I don't even know if it was around like eight years ago. I mean, I can really think it's only been around like three or four years. I don't know. Either way, we have it now. And so since I know where everything is, I don't need to be figuring it out. I can make an incision for real. It's about the size. It's not super duper small, but it's the size of this part of the pen, this black part of the pen. You could do a little smaller, but different arguments. But this part of the pen, probably this far of the patient, and then I can use a navigate thing to drill a hole, put a screw, drill a hole, screw, and then same thing with the other side. And that's just a great way using augmented reality to fix certain spine issues. Um, it's just great we have technology. So kind of jumping back to your thing, Henry, I hear that all the time. Patients that aren't even my patients are scared to get surgery. They know what they have. They know the fix. They've heard it from 10 people, you know, Surgery doesn't always work. Surgery is painful. Surgery is expensive. Surgery has a lot of anxiety as it should. But I try to be glass half full because if you know you need it and if you know it's going to get you better, that's great. I unfortunately see way too many people that have terrible pain and like I can't really diagnose it or their imaging don't doesn't look that bad. Or maybe they had a fusion and it's all healed, but everything looks perfect and they still have pain. And that kind of sucks. So it's great to know that there's a um, answer out there. Pilly is a girl. Okay, good. Yep. And we've been talking forever and a long time commenter. I appreciate it. Someone definitely has their subscription on and alerts when I start. So I'm going to do this for another um, five or 10 minutes and we'll go from there. Uh, from Steve Smith. Hope to talk to you tomorrow for reviewing. Yep. I look forward to that also from Joe Gibbs. I've had several back surgeries. My thoracic area hurts when standing up straight and messes with my breathing. Have you ever heard of a patient saying their back pain can affect breathing? Uh, not a hundred percent. It's something like if you're clenched over looking at this, I'm looking at your picture now, you kind of look pretty young. So I don't know if you have a terrible adult degenerative scoliosis, but maybe but that could be a reason, but just from having some wear and tear in the back, no, that wouldn't affect breathing problems, but you could have total collapse of the spine and then that could squeeze the nerves. I'll jump some questions here now. Sorry. I've been kind of ignoring those, but I'm going to get to those now. Um, from God, somebody coming in fast. What do I think about spinal cord stimulators? Mixed feelings. I think they're fine. I don't, I rarely send someone out to go get one because usually when I see them, there's like a surgical fix and I recommend surgery or I say, wow, there's really not that much going on. I wouldn't recommend a spinal cord stimulator, stuff like that. A um, couple more things. What are the reasons for choosing bone scalpel other than ultrasonic instruments? I think it's just faster, safer, and it irrigates the, like you're just clean, you're doing the laminectomy. When you do it with ultrasound, Ah, oh, crud. My kiddo's getting out of bed. Is he? I'm going to have to go immediately. Well, that's fun. Oh, hi, everyone. I have to stop this live stream. My kid just woke up from his nap, and I got to go get him. So that's usually how